All right guys, welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be brewing a smash recipe. So what is a smash recipe, you ask? Uh, smash is actually an acronym, single malt and single hop. Uh, what these recipes are used for typically is for highlighting the uh, characteristics of a specific hop without having any extra malts to uh, kind of hide anything. Uh, and for me, today I'm choosing that hop to be mosaic. Uh, Mosaic is a pretty interesting hop. It's relatively new in the brewing world um, and uh, it's derived from Simcoe and Nugget, I believe. Uh, it's a high alpha hop and it's pretty popular in uh, New England style IPAs and uh, a lot of more trendy kind of IPAs. It's not really um, super prevalent in uh, West Coast styles that I usually like to brew. Um, but for the first time, I'm going to be trying out a single hop version of it. So why did I choose Mosaic? Well, I've actually had several beers um, that have prominently featured Mosaic hops. And I've been curious because every single time, they all tasted somewhat different. There were different aspects and nuances of it um, that kind of made it difficult for me to really pinpoint what exactly does Mosaic taste like? Uh, what does it smell like? What is it, what's its behavior? So what we're going to do here today is put that to bed. Um, I am using a very simple recipe here, but what we're gonna do for the first time, something I've never tried before, is first work hopping, uh, which means adding hops before the boil um, and after the mash. And uh, also we're gonna be doing a big proper whirlpool at a proper temperature. Um, some of my whirlpools in the past have been a little hot, so we're gonna get it down to 180 and do that. But anyway, a uh, very simple recipe. We're just using 12 pounds of Maris Otter malt uh, which is your base malt. That is a very nice balanced, um, somewhat bready, somewhat flavorful uh, base malt that's just going to be a very nice background. I don't want to use Pilsner or Turo for no particular reason. I just haven't used Maris Otter in a while and I really like it. Uh, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of hop additions, all mosaic, all 10.8% alpha acid. So we're going to do one ounce of mosaic as a first wort hop. So what that means is basically putting in that uh, hop addition right after the mash and before the boil while the uh, wort is at kind of post mash temperature and then raising that up to the boil. Um, so then our next hop addition is actually going to be 15 minutes uh, where we'll add another ounce of mosaic uh, and then a zero minute addition with another ounce and then I'm going to do a whirlpool at 180 degrees for about 30 minutes uh, with an ounce and a half of mosaic. And I am not going to dry hop this, uh, mainly because I kind of don't want to take the extra time. Uh, we're looking at about an estimated IBU count of 86. Now, that's really high for a pale ale. Um, now, I'm trying to target this as a pale ale, but one thing to keep in mind is that that first warp hop addition actually adds an additional about 10% IBUs as compared to a 60 minute kettle addition. And most people agree that first four hopping actually tends to produce a much smoother, less aggressive bittering than if you just chucked it in at the 60 minute mark. Uh, we're gonna find out how that goes. Uh, so whether this is actually gonna be a pale ale or an IPA, I don't know, it's gonna be borderline. Uh, that definition generally does change depending on who you're talking to. Uh, for all accounts and purposes, some session IPAs could be considered pale ales and some pale ales could be considered IPAs. And, um, it's a really gray area. Uh, I'm gonna try and call it a pale ale, but if it just ends up being over the top hoppy, then yeah, we'll call it an IPA. You really want a hardline answer on this. Uh, your best bet is to go to the BJCP and look at the style guidelines for the pale ale versus the IPA. Um, and I believe the maximum bitterness on a pale ale is about 50 IBUs. Uh, but interestingly enough, the maximum bitterness on a IPA is like 70 to 90, I think. And I've definitely seen plenty of commercial examples of a standard IPA, not a double IPA, that have gone well up into the hundreds. So keep that in mind. Um, styles are always flexible, and this is definitely going to be on the hoppier end of a pale ale or kind of in the lower end of an IPA as far as bitterness goes. But that's for metrics only, uh, and the actual experience of drinking the beer might be very different. So we'll find out. So as far as yeast goes, uh, I'm going to try using Imperial yeast for the first time. Uh, many people have suggested that I actually check them out. They apparently have a very good reputation for excellent yeast varieties. Um, so I'm using their A38, which is juice. Um, <laughs> so that's supposed to be like a New England IPA style. Uh, it is, however, a medium flocculator, so maybe I can get it to clear up. I would like this to be a clear beer. Um, and uh, it's supposed to really accentuate the nice kind of floral and uh, citrus aromas of some of the 
more modern style hops. Mosaic fits right into that category, I think. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Um, if I really like it, I might use it in the New England IPA that I got planned for later this year. And then finally, uh, we're going to be doing water stuff again. Um, so my last brew, the Black IPA, uh, that had um, a decent result with the, uh, the water profile additions that I made. However, I was missing some salts, so it ended up being a little more acidic than it was supposed to be. Um, but all in all, it worked out pretty well, and I'll probably be just doing this uh, for the remainder of my beers. It's a really easy thing to add to your brewing process, so I'm going to include a link to a video up here in the corner uh, that'll explain that a little bit better, so feel free to check that out. Yeah, so for our water profile, first of all, I'm using Camden tablets for the first time. What we are using it for is to remove the chloramines and the chlorine from city water. Our total concentration of brewing ions uh, for our target water profile is the following. 101 parts per million of calcium, 10 parts per million of magnesium, 55 parts per million of sodium, and I can't lower that because that's what's in my city tap water, um, and I really don't feel like doing dilution. Um, 134 parts per million of sulfate, 44 parts per million of chloride, so that gives us a good ratio between those two for hops, and uh, 75 parts per million of carbonate. Uh, so in order to achieve that profile, these are the additions that I'm using uh, and adding to my base water. Uh, 5 grams of gypsum, 3 grams of epsom, 2 grams of calcium chloride, and 3 grams of calcium carbonate. So hopefully that yields a nice good water profile. Uh, we're going to mash this for 90 minutes at 153 degrees. Just an FYI, I always put the full recipe down in the description of the video. Sometimes it's hidden. Um, feel free to check that out. That has everything all the way through the fermentation and any post-fermentation stuff that I do like dry hopping. Uh, that's all covered down in there. So without further ado, I'm going to start heating up my strike water and uh, adding brewing salts to it. So let's get this show on the road. So like I said, we're using Camden tablets for the first time, which is potassium metabisulfate. Uh, you'll see instructions on the package that say use one tablet per gallon. That is in reference to winemakers, because these are used to actually add sulfites to wine. We don't need to worry about that, we're just using it to remove the chlorine and chloramines from the water. And uh, in that case, the concentration recommended is one tablet, one of these, per 20 gallons of water. All right, so I'm using eight gallons of brewing water, which means that I have about two-fifths of the uh, 20 gallons, you know. Uh, eight over 20 is equal to two-fifths. So what we want to do here is take one tablet and dissolve it in a small quantity of water, which is just about one cup right here. And we're going to mix that up nicely. Um, and then basically we're going to add the same ratio of this small amount of water to my brewing water, which is two-fifths. So two-fifths of a cup would go into eight gallons of brewing water uh, to properly remove the chlorine and chloramines. And then we're going to let that water sit for about 20 or so minutes. I don't really know if there's a specific reason why we don't just add the whole tablet to uh, five or eight gallons of brewing water, um, but I think it's because Sometimes there are people that are very sensitive to sulfites, uh, like in wine, so they might not drink wine, but they might drink beer. And if you give them your sulfite heavy beer, they might actually have a bad reaction to it. You never know, um, so I'm just gonna play it safe. So now I've got my just under half a cup of Camden tablet solution, and I just add that to my pre mash strike water. All right, so our strike water has reached its appropriate temperature, which means it is now time to add the grain bag and begin the mash. All right, so our uh, mash temperature is looking at, it's a little low actually, I don't know why, uh, but now it's like 150 degrees, which is okay. Um, but if you notice me kind of like messing around in there for a second, 
It uh, looks like I made a little mistake here. Uh, I crushed my grain at the local home brew shop and I have a bad feeling that uh, their mill settings were set really wide because it sure looks like a lot of these kernels aren't actually cracked. Um, so I really hope that's not the case and I really hope we get a good gravity out of this, but um, we're going to drive on anyway, otherwise it could be, it could be pretty interesting otherwise. Okay, so it's about 10 minutes into the mash now, and I just pulled a small sample and cooled it down. Uh, we're going to measure the mash pH, and uh, yes, I'm going to be using pH strips, not an actual pH meter, because those things are expensive, and I'm just ballparking. So basically, the pH strip looks like this when it comes out. It's got this little color scale right here, to let you know the approximate pH within plus or minus 0.5. Um, so basically, yeah, we just I have my cooled off sample here and uh, we just dip it in briefly see how it immediately changes color and then compare it to the chart so so right now it looks like our pH is like about 5.5 I want to say it's closer to 5.5 uh, which is good news for me um, ideally you want it to be between 5.2 and 5.6 Alright, so uh, mash is complete, and it's definitely complete because I sort of forgot about it, and it's probably been like an hour and 45 minutes, maybe two hours, but uh, we might have lost a little more temperature than, uh, well, I guess was expected, um, but that's okay, I mean, yeah, final reading is 146, I think it was 150 when I dropped in the grain, um, but over two hours, I mean, that kind of loss is, uh, is not really that bad. So all in all, it's in the right temperature range uh, for extracting the proper enzymes and uh, letting them do their work. So hopefully, assuming my grain crush is still adequate, um, hopefully we actually end up with a decent pre-boil OG on this. Well, normally what would happen now is I would drain the bag um, and then I would rinse off the grain bag with water until I reach my appropriate uh, pre-boil calculated volumes uh, and then begin the boil. What we're going to do is pretty similar, but first I'm going to take the bag out and then I'm going to immediately dump in my first wort hops. Now I'll start rinsing the grain and uh, raising the volume back up to its pre-boil calculated volume and uh, we'll also get ready for a uh, pre-boil OG sample. Alright, so we just hit our boil. It's uh, a 60 minute boil. There is no bittering addition. I'm just using that first word hopping addition as the bittering addition basically. Um, so now we're going to leave it here for about 45 minutes and then we'll come back and add a whole bunch of other stuff. Alright, so uh, we cooled off our pre-boil OG sample here and uh, pleasantly surprised to see a pre-boil OG of about uh, 1.048. Uh, so it's actually a little bit higher than our anticipated uh, pre-boil OG. Hopefully I can get that to focus and you can see that. Basically that's really good news. Um, because I was kind of anticipating having to adjust and up to my gravity because the crush looked really, really bad. Um, but I guess that wasn't necessary and I'm not mad at all. As a teaching point, um, in the event that I did actually have a really low OG, like 10, 15 gravity points lower than what I was expecting for my pre-boil OG, uh, then I would actually have uh, two options basically to kind of bring that up. I can either add extra fermentables into the wort, like sugar, or preferably dry malt extract. Or two, I can just boil this down uh, a bit longer. So that'll raise the gravity, darken the beer, and yield a lot less beer overall. But I would actually have the appropriate uh, percentage alcohol. But anyway, none of those things are necessary in this particular brew, so that's good. Uh, it's looking nice and pale, and uh, yeah right on target as far as what we want so that's really good news all right so it is now 15 minutes from the end of the boil so we're gonna go ahead and add a whirl flock tablet two and a half teaspoons of yeast nutrient and an ounce 
of mosaic, uh, as well as my chiller to start sanitizing it with the boiling. All right, so our boil is over, and uh, I'm just now gonna grab a quick little uh, sample for my OG before I start clogging everything up with more hops. And then uh, we're gonna put that in the freezer and hopefully it'll cool down quickly. And now we add our zero minute hop addition which is just another ounce of mosaic and shut off the heat. So once the dial hits about 180 or so, I'm gonna dump in the remaining ounce and a half I have of my mosaic hops for a whirlpool and I'm gonna turn off the chiller and hopefully it will be able to kind of sit there at 180 to 170 degrees, about 20 to 30 minutes um, and that will extract a whole bunch of, um, of hop oils out of the hops without actually evaporating them off. So that should provide ample boost to hop flavor and aroma. Um, and it's worked before in some of my beers, although I haven't quite implemented it correctly because um, I've never had a kettle mounted thermometer until, uh, well, about November. So this is good, uh, allows me to actually be a little more accurate in my uh, whirlpool um, procedures. So also, fermentation of this beer is pretty simple and straightforward. It's a standard ale fermentation. It's uh, it's just going to be two weeks in the fermenter, about 65 to 68 degrees, um, and obviously when we pitch the yeast, it'll be about 60 degrees. Uh, so hopefully it goes well. In the matter of uh, minutes that it took me to actually film that take, it's now right at where we want it. So we're going to shut off our uh, cooler. So now that the water flow through the chiller has been shut off, we're just going to take this ounce and a half of the mosaic and uh, dump that in. Now we let that sit there for like 20 to 30 minutes. So there we have our final gravity measurement, which is about 1.060. Um, considering we had a target gravity of about 1.058, that's actually pretty awesome. So we're right on target. That means it was a pretty solid brew day, um, which is good because I was worried about that, uh, that issue with the crush and possibly not having a good mash efficiency, but uh, thankfully that was not the case. So once this is cooled down, um, the Whirlpool has finished, by the way, it's been well over 30 minutes, but once it's finished, we're gonna go ahead and uh, actually aerate the wort and pitch the yeast right away. Um, the nice thing about Imperial yeast, and here I'll grab the packet for you, uh, is that it's actually 200 billion cells already. So most liquid yeast packets like Y yeast or White Labs, um, they are a small quantity of yeast cells that actually require a starter to get set and get going um, to generate enough cells so that you actually have a proper pitch into the uh, wort. Now, Imperial Yeast, and I think there's another one, Giga Yeast, and a couple others out there, um, kind of have made their own market by selling liquid yeast packets that have a full pitch worth in them. So assuming that my gravity is under like 1.070, um, I'm generally good with a single packet, um, and my gravity is just fine. So, but just to keep that in perspective, this yeast packet is about the same as a single dry yeast packet. It's definitely enough cells to actually get a successful fermentation going without under pitching. So over the last like 30 minutes or so that I've been cooling down the wort using my immersion chiller, I discovered that there was actually a small leak um, in my chiller where the uh, plastic tubing connects to the actual copper part of the chiller. So I have had pure tap water slowly running into my cold wort uh, over the last 30 minutes or so, which is a huge risk for infection. So. I really, really, really hope that uh, that's not going to happen, but we're going to find out. Anyway, we've officially cooled everything down to the appropriate temperature, um, and uh, because there's so many hops in there, uh, there's a good chance I end up getting kind of a big hop sludge coming out of this thing. So what I'm going to try to do is stir it up, get a good kind of literal whirlpool going, um, and hopefully that forces all the sludge to the center and I can actually pull cleaner, clearer work out. Um, but as we do that, we're going to be sending the wort straight out this valve and splashing it in a fermenter in an attempt to aerate a little better.
So while that method provides arguably great aeration, considering that there's only like five gallons of wort in here, there's a ton of foam all the way up to the edge of the fermenter. That being said, I still end up getting pretty much all of the hop debris and trube and other junk into this thing, so that's... That's not awesome. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the proper way to do this is, but somehow there's no trube in my kettle. There's no junk in there. It's all in there. So yeah, not ideal. Don't do that. I do know that since it's a short fermentation, I'm not letting it sit on the hops for a while, um, and that I can cold crash this and use roll flock. Number one, the clarity should not be affected. Number two, I just hope that there's no like vegetal off flavors. Uh, because of all of the hop debris in there. There's plenty of evidence out there that says that having all of the junk in your kettle end up in your fermenter is actually not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it is indeed good for the yeast. Um, so between that and I'm kind of having a serious risk for infection with a leaky chiller, um, I'm a little worried actually about how this is gonna go. Not much else we can do otherwise though. We just gotta ferment it and see what happens. All right, now let's just hope this thing does what it's actually supposed to do. And we leave it here for two weeks at 65-ish degrees. So it is usually a good idea to check uh, the fermentation progress of your beer as it moves along every couple days or so. Pull a gravity sample and that way you can most importantly see the gravity reading so you get an indication of how quickly your uh, fermentation is moving along, but also to kind of get a good idea of what the flavor might turn out to be like. So I took my first gravity reading and uh, it's already down to 1.014. Now to put that in perspective, uh, I actually started this on Saturday and it's Tuesday. Uh, so things have very clearly been cranking right along. Uh, so we are done with almost 90% of our fermentation. It's still at high Krausen, so there's a lot that has to be done. You definitely don't want to pull it early. Um, I'm just going to wait for that Krausen to settle down, and then of course we'll cold crash and, and all that. But I might actually be able to bottle this earlier than two weeks, um, depending on how the flavor is moving along. Speaking of which, now this already has some pretty amazing hop aroma coming out of it. Um, that kind of nice juicy papaya style uh, I guess, um, yeah, pretty strong tropical, but kind of funky notes too from uh, Mosaic. But most importantly, it does not smell like it's been infected yet. So hopefully, knock on wood, um, we're good to go. So in for a little bit of a first time uh, tasting this. Wow. It's a winner. Even though that is still filled with yeast and has a little bit of that kind of green apple young beer flavor, um, that is not too bitter. And that is a very, woo, very nice malt palette on this thing. But uh, the hop flavor is excellent. I am extremely excited to see how this matures. Okay, so our final gravity sample is in. It's been fermenting for about 10 days, and uh, this yeast absolutely blew through fermentation. Uh, it is, uh, like I said, it's been 10 days. Uh, we got a final gravity about 1.008, so I'm gonna go ahead and put this in the fridge uh, to cold crash, and uh, then hopefully we'll bottle this weekend. Um, but yeah, fermentation's pretty much done, and it smells and tastes fantastic. So I cold crashed for three days and then I bottled on Friday. Uh, so it has now been two weeks since that day and uh, by now the beer should be fully carbonated and all of that young beer flavor should have dissipated by now. Um, I have been sampling this uh, somewhat frequently uh, over the course of its carbonation because it's really delicious. Uh, this is definitely one of the better beers that I've made in a bit. I'm just really happy that uh, despite all of the issues that I had during the brew with the bad crush and with a possible risk of infection and dumping all of the hop debris into the fermenter, uh, we still ended up with a really good result. So here we are with the final result. I called it Lion's Head Ale. The reason for that is because Lion's Head is the winter route to get up to Mount Washington. Uh, so last Tuesday, the last day of winter, I uh, ended up summoning Mount Washington via that trail um, which was a huge goal of mine that I've been working towards over the last several uh, months, really. Um, 
Basically, I'm super into hiking and mountaineering. Um, it's kind of a good method to burn off all this beer that I make. Um, but that, that goal of climbing Mount Washington in the winter uh, was just realized and uh, I just felt like that was a good thing to name this beer after. It was a really awesome day, really good weather. Um, the wind chill at the summit was only minus 30, so that's actually not that bad, uh, all things considered. I figured that was a really good excuse to name this beer something, because I was also really struggling to find a good name for it. But anyway, uh, I digress. Here are the final results. We have um, a 6.8% ABV and 86 IBUs. Now, um, the BJCP would define this as an IPA, but based on the way it tastes, I really would feel like this is actually going to classify as a pale ale. Um, it is actually just not as aggressively hop as an IPA, but we'll get into that. So let's go ahead and pour. So, uh, let's see if I can get a closer look like that. So, right now we're looking at a medium clear beer. It's really not bright at all. Um, there's a lot of dissolved yeast in there. Um, there's a lot of sediment, I think, still in there um, from the yeast. It's not a high flocculating strain. It's really hard to get out. That's fine. I did cold crash it and I did use roll flock, but um, that's about as good as I can get with that, I guess. Um, that's all right, I kind of figured that was going to happen using this yeast. Uh, it's a really nice kind of dark golden color. Um, Marisar is definitely a darker base malt uh, than Turo or Pilsner, uh, and that's fine. I think it's actually a really nice color. Um, head retention uh, kind of sucks. It's not really staying in there at all. <laughs> it's really not pouring a very strong head, and uh, it goes away pretty quickly. Now, because it is a single malt ale, um, that means I can't throw in things like carapils, but it could also be related to the fact that I just use a single infusion mash. Um, nothing wrong with that though. This beer is not about looks or color or malt flavor. It's all about that hop mosaic. So moving on to the aroma, and that's where it really shines. So this, I did not dry hop at all. And it has a very powerful hop aroma. Very, very, uh, Strong notes of pineapple and uh, tropical fruit. A little stone fruit as well, I think. Um, it's just, uh, it's very tropical, um, which definitely is helped by the yeast as well. This yeast pairs phenomenally with this hop. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just a really nice, kind of juicy smelling beer. So next up is body. Um, yeah, body's kind of like a medium mouthfeel. Uh, it feels kind of dry, but not really that much. Um, overall, very uh, very drinkable, very easy to down this pretty quickly, I think. Doesn't really hang around in your tongue too much. It's just uh, there for a bit. Um, but it's not really light bodied either. It's, uh, it's a good kind of middle of the road, which is exactly what I was aiming for. All right, so next up is flavor. So the bitterness, um, like I said when I was kind of introducing this beer, uh, it definitely doesn't feel like it's a full-fledged IPA. While it has 86 IBUs, it definitely doesn't feel uh, like it's super hoppy. It's definitely not something that makes you uh, feel like it's over the top bitter. Uh, so that red IPA I brewed last year uh, had a pretty similar level of hopping to it. Uh, I think it was like 85 IBUs if I remember correctly. And that was extremely bitter compared to this. Um, so there's definitely a noticeable uh, lack of upfront bittering for using the first word hops. Uh, I really think that that was uh, a great method. Uh, it's very smooth when it comes in. So a lot of that bitterness um, was very citrusy. The hop flavors come through splendidly. The most prominent flavor I'm getting out of this is grapefruit um, with a little bit of an earthy tinge to the back half of it. Um, just a really interesting, really nice, uh, very different uh, overall hop flavor. I really enjoy this. And yeah, it finishes off with a pretty nice, clean malt finish. A uh, little bit of 
I guess breadiness really is kind of the, the closest flavor. Um, the Amerisadra is known for being fairly bready. It's typically an English-based malt, um, and this is not an English style at all, but it just works well, I think. Uh, it doesn't get in the way of anything, and it's just a nice kind of solid backdrop uh, for all of this. Uh, really, really enjoy this beer. Very drinkable. As you can see, I've already burned through a good portion of it. Um, it's, uh, I love it. Uh, it's definitely one of the best hoppy beers that I've made in a long time. Uh, and I definitely would chalk that up to using uh, A, a good water profile, and B, I really think that that Imperial Yeast uh, did a great job of highlighting these uh, hop flavors. I think that was definitely a huge part of it. So bottom line, definitely, definitely would brew this one again. Um, so if I wasn't constrained by the single malt, single hop thing, I would absolutely add some carapils in here just to add a little bit extra head retention capability. Um, and uh, actually that would add a little bit of residual sweetness. I think it would raise that final gravity a bit. It's not unbalanced at all. It's actually quite well balanced. Um, but a little bit of residual sweetness wouldn't be a bad thing, I think. Um, as far as hops go, you could definitely make a fantastic beer with just mosaic. Uh, it is a really uh, interesting and complex hop that has a lot of interesting little flavors to it, so um, definitely not one-dimensional at all. As far as first word hopping goes, I think I'm going to start adding that to pretty much every single hop forward beer that I make. Um, that is a very smooth bitterness that I really can't get enough of. Alright, so that's about it. So, uh, thanks for watching this all the way to the end of the video. If you do decide to brew this beer, please go ahead and let me know in the comments below. Uh, I really would like to help out if I can. It's really solid and I do definitely recommend brewing uh, smash beers as a way to figure out what hops taste like. Um, it's a really fun thing to do. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, etc., please feel free to drop those in the comments section below as well, as long as they are civil. If you like this video, please consider dropping a like. Uh, if you like watching me do the things that I do and like to stay tuned for more stuff like this, please consider hitting that subscribe button and uh, also the bell icon right next to it so you get notified when I upload a new video. And see my current subscribers, thank you very much for watching my content and uh, letting me know what you think of it. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of this beer, and I will catch you in the next one, so cheers.